Rayons here. In this video, I will walk you through a full stack implementation of OAuth 2 authentication for a Next.js static app with a Node.js backend. This is a model I have used for years. I have recently refactored it and will share it with you. We'll be examining the increaser.org codebase. It is housed in a private repo, but don't worry. I'll include all the necessary snippets in the blog post in the description. Additionally, you can find all the reusable components, hooks, and utils at the React Kit repository. While Increaser provides Google and Facebook login, I had previously implemented LinkedIn and Twitter options. All these providers adhere to the same OAuth 2 standard. Hence, once you understand the concept explained in this video, you can easily expand your OAuth options. Let's begin with the front end. Here we have the OAuth options component which is used on both the sign-in and sign-up pages to display all the available OAuth providers. The options array includes Google and Facebook. The OAuth provider type is derived from the types generated from the GraphQL schema. Type generation is not this video's focus, but if you are curious about how I manage it in a modern repo, check out this video. The OAuth option component is a link that triggers the OAuth flow by opening the Facebook or Google login page in the same tab. When the user clicks the link, we also send an event to our analytics service to monitor the conversion rate between different providers. Data from Increaser reveal that Google and Facebook have the same conversion rate. However, 10 times more users choose Google over Facebook. Back when I had Twitter and LinkedIn options, they attracted even fewer users, leading me to remove them to avoid cluttering the UI. Our button is rendered solely for visual purposes as a div element, hence there is no need to pad the on-click handler. The icon is rendered using the match component from React Key. It functions as a switch statement for React components. The icon-centric button component is a wrapper around the reusable button component which I discussed in this video. Our goal here is to center the text while keeping the icon absolutely positioned to the left for aesthetic purposes. To construct the URL for the OAuth flow, we use the get OAuth URL function. This returns the URL for the specified provider. We first extract the base URL from the OAuth base URL record object, then build an object with shared query params. The client ID is extracted from the OAuth client ID record object, which relies on environment variable. To acquire the keys, you must set up OAuth for your app within Google and Facebook Developer Console. The get OAuth redirect URI function is used to build the redirect URI. This function extracts the app base URL from environment variable. In the production version of Increaser, this would be at increaser.org and localhost 3000 for local development. The function then adds OAuth slash provider to the base URL. This implies that Google will redirect the user to inquisitor.org slash OAuth slash Google after logging in on their platform. The scope represents the list of permissions we request from the user. For Google, these scope URLs are separated by space, while for Facebook, it's a comma separated list of permissions. As a response type, we desire to receive a code. Then we have a few custom query parameters for each provider. Once again, we are using the match function from ReactKit to replace the switch statement. To integrate an object with query params into a URL, we employ the add query params function from ReactKit. After signing in on Google or Facebook login pages, the user will be redirected back to our app as specified by the redirect URI parameter. These pages use the same component to manage the OAuth redirect. We simply pass unique provider names to these pages so that they can be pre-rendered with a title. This eliminates the slight layout shift between a pre-rendered page and a page that is rendered on the client side after extracting the provider name from the root. The OAuth content component extracts the code from the query prompts and send it to our API in combination with the provider name and redirect URI. The time zone parameter is specific to Increaser. While awaiting the API response, we display a spinner within the same container we had on the sign-in and sign-up pages for visual consistency. Users can only be in one of two states on this page, either waiting for the API response or dealing with an error. Therefore, the OAuth confirmation status component will show a spinner or display an error message that prompts the user to try again by returning to the sign-in page. There is only one type of message that makes sense to the user, and I'll explain this in the backend code section. All other errors are meant for us developers to identify what went wrong. That's why we include a support contact in case the user is stuck. A crucial point to note here is that I disable React streak mode. Otherwise, when we run the app locally, 
it will purposely code the re-rendering of the component, resulting in a double request to the API. To disable React Strict Mode, we add React Strict Mode force to the next.config.js file. If you have an efficient solution for keeping React Strict Mode enabled while preventing a second request, please let me know. I use the use handle query params hook from React Kit because the query parameter will be missing on the first render. We wait for the query params to be available before sending the request to the API. The parse query derived from the use router will have a type where all the values are optional. Due to this, we need to assert the type to inform TypeScript that the query prompts will indeed be present. We prefer not to handle cases where the user manipulates the query prompt. If this happens, it's better to let the app crash. In the use authenticate with OAuth mutation hook, we execute a GraphQL request to our API and update the session by invoking the update session function from the use out session hook. We store the out session in local storage. For more information about managing local storage effectively, check out this video. Since the use out session hook is the only mechanism through which we update the session, we can wrap the set session function in incorporate analytics events for successful authentication and a call to clear the cache when the user signs out. The session comprises a GVT token, expiration date, and a flag indicating whether it's the user's first sign-in. Currently, I don't use the expiration date, but if it's suitable for your app, you can check the expiration time on app startup and how to sign out the user if the token is about to expire. This prevents it from happening in the middle of an important user interaction. For authenticated requests to the API, we retrieve the token from the use authorization hook and add it to the authorization header in the use API hook. On the server side, we have a query named auth session with OAuth. It takes provider code redirect URI and a parameter specific to increaser, time zone. It returns the out session with the GVT token, the expiration time, and a sign that shows if it's the user's first sign in, indicating that they just registered in the app. This can be used to trigger an onboarding flow on the front end, for example. The query implementation consists of two parts. The user is first authenticated with Google or Facebook, and then authorized in our app. In the authenticate with OAuth function, we first validate the code form on the front end, by acquiring the access token from Google or Facebook. We employ the match function again to pair the provider with the appropriate request. Also, we use different requests for the providers. We expect the same response, an access token from both. On the server side, we access secrets by using a get secret function. You will implement this differently based on your infrastructure. Perhaps you can safely use environment variables or use AWS secrets manager in the case of AWS, which you covered in this video. Query Google and Facebook APIs using a simple fetch wrapper titled Query OS Provider. This will show an authentication error if the response status isn't 200. We do not focus much on formatting the error because it won't make sense to the user anyway. We attach the action name to the error message to understand the step in the authentication flow that failed. Once we have the access token, we can retrieve the user's info from Google or Facebook. Here we apply the same pattern as in the previous function. It should be noted that having a Facebook account doesn't necessarily mean a user has an email because they might have signed up for Facebook using a phone number. Also, this situation is quite unlikely. I had a few instances with Increaser. While it's possible to implement an app that does not require a user to have an email, I chose to make email a mandatory field to avoid unnecessary concerns. Once we've authenticated the user with the OAuth provider, we can authorize them in our app. First, we check if a user with a given email already exists in our database. If it does, we return the out session. Otherwise, we create a new user and return the out session with a flag indicating it's the user's first sign in. We use get out session to construct an object with a GVT token and expiration time. We use a secret to sign in token and set the lifespan for 300 days. We rely on another function from React Kit to convert units. Become an effective 10x programmer with my productivity app at increaser.org.